It's your daily dose of Donna. I hope this is working, you guys. I am struggling today on the live feed over on YouTube. We're having some StreamYard issues, so hopefully this one's going. Welcome to the show. Uh, that just throws me off. Whenever there's like some sort of technical issue, everything gets thrown off. Now I can't do my normal um, opening, you know, song. I may just have to sing for you guys in just a moment, but it's your daily dose of Donna. It is Wednesday, April 10th. <laughs> uh, I have to get my bearings down. I'm using the actual YouTube live streaming platform, which is interesting. It's a little bit different for me. I don't love it because I find myself like, um, you know, just getting a little confused. Everything looks different. We're in a new home. We've moved. But I see you guys here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, you guys are finding me slowly, slowly. Yeah, if one of you guys want to just jump into the old feed and just let them know that we're here. <sighs> it's Donna Unplugged. This is the acoustic version of Daily Dose of Donna. For those of you that are wondering what the hell is going on because you're listening to the audio version, just jump on over to YouTube, see if it looks any different to you. Oh my gosh, you guys. And I have a little bit of a hard out today. That's what she said. So we are going to have to talk about all kinds of things. Fast. Fast. Give it all fast. Um, okay, good. Everyone says it looks good. You guys, Patreon this week, I'm going to, I've decided, I want to talk about Jeff and Jordan from Big Brother. I know that that's so random, but they have a podcast um, called Together Mess and I'm obsessed with them. And they had a really interesting episode today all about like, cancel culture and stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about the toast, not my breakfast, but the toast podcast. Love those girls. So I'm going to talk about them. And then um, we're going to talk about actually one of the girls from Vanderpump Rules from last night, Tori Keith. I have a whole story about that. So we'll get into that. Um, thank you so much for joining Patreon. All of you guys, we have a happy hour on Friday on Zoom if you're part of the upper tier. And then of course, um, the new episodes air usually Wednesday or Thursday for everyone else. And like I have videos and stuff that I put up every once in a while. So it'll be really fun over there. Okay. Breathe, Donna. We're back. Have to figure out that stream yard, man. All right. Before I get into today's show, because we have to talk about so many things, I just want to talk about uh, the first two sponsors of Daily Dose of Donna this week, and that is One Skin. One Skin um, is a, a great skin routine that really roots itself in science. And because when you look at me and when you look at my channel, you think, oh my gosh, you are a science girl, right? Like, you might as well call me Donna and I, the science guy. Donna and I, the science guy. Um, that's actually not true. I'm not really into science, but if it's going to make me look better, then sure. I mean, I'm all about, you know, the materialistic side or the surface side of, you know, looking good. And that is one skin because one skin uses these OSO1 peptides. It's the first ingredient proven to switch off the aging cells that cause lines wrinkles, and thinning skin. And, you know, we want to be thin in a lot of places maybe, but not in our skin. Okay, not in our skin. And they have so many studies to back it up. So get 15% off your one skin purchase using the code daily dose. That's one word daily dose. When you check out at oneskin.co, try one skin and enjoy healthier, younger skin without all the extra steps. We're also sponsored by Dr. Motion Socks, the compression socks for all us oldies. And I say that as a joke because I'm 42 turning 43 in June, but I feel... Well, it depends on the day. Sometimes I feel 21. Sometimes I feel 92. But I still love me some compression socks because I am athletic. I am active. And uh, I really notice a difference in the way I feel when I'm wearing the compression socks, except, especially the tights. Why? Say it all with me. All of you dosers that are here every day, why do I love those compression tights? Because they have a gusseted crotch that keeps you dry. And if Lance, you're watching, now you know why I wear those compression tights. Okay. See a lot of your comments. Josh says you're having a similar day as me. Yes. The day that feels like everything's falling apart around you. What's up? What's up with that? Um, let's see. Uh, Josh says, how much merch do I have to buy to make the Zoom call on Saturday instead? Listen, we can do a poll. 
if you guys want to do a Saturday afternoon, like happy hour hang, I'm down to do that. I'm down. Okay. So let me know over there. You guys, did you hear the news about BravoCon? BravoCon is not happening this year. Now, strangely enough, you know who the first person that I heard talk about that was? Rick and Kelly. Kelly from, um, uh, Kelly Dodd from Real Houses of OC previously on OC. She had mentioned this a few months ago, but there was no like confirmation of it and no one else had said anything. But I kept thinking to myself, like we're in April. By April, you would think they have at least announced the dates. You think they would at least announce like some information so people could get, like, get into the saving of it or buying tickets or buy. Because I feel like by this time last year, we were already like well into knowing the dates and stuff. So it really actually is like a thing, you guys. BravoCon is not happening. If you were on BravoCon's text message um, system, they had they had sent out a message today. That says, we're shaking. We're physically shaking. BravoCon returns to Las Vegas in November 2025. Plus, we're kicking off some all new events this spring in New York and LA. Get all the details at the link above. So I have not clicked on that link. Maybe I should right now. Um, so a lot of people have different like theories on why that is. I'll tell you this. You know, if you're thinking that it didn't make money, I can't tell you the exact amount of people that were there, but it was a full room. It was very, very full and it was not cheap. So I can't imagine that they didn't make any money on ticket sales. The only thing I'm thinking is maybe they spent so much money on everyone's, you know, hotels because they paid everyone to come out. They paid for their hotels. I think they gave them all like a stipend of, I think it was like $3,000. I don't think it was anything like too crazy, but Bravo makes a lot of money. You know, I mean, they were also selling tons of like merch and cocktails and stuff. I mean, I didn't buy any drinks there, but I remember seeing like people were saying that drinks were really expensive. Um, they also had the VIP option and different little things. So I don't really know if it was a money thing, if it was a um, availability issue. Maybe they struggled with the availability. My guess is it's the election year. I know that that sounds crazy, but if I'm correct, it was right around the election. It, well, it's November, which is the election month. And it, maybe they just like thought it was too much. I could be wrong. I could be wrong because like Bravo and elections don't really connect to me or, you know, whatever, but it's possible. Now, the way that they're kind of painting this online is just very positively. They're not talking about anything about 2024, but it's saying they already have the dates November 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2025. Thank God it's not November 13th because that's my son's birthday. That would suck. Maybe I take Dylan to Vegas with me for his birthday. And then Lance like goes off and hangs out with him while I do BravoCon stuff. I'm sure Lance will be down for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they said there was 27,000 people at the last BravoCon. It will definitely be at Caesars um, Forum in Las Vegas, the same location. And it's not really saying, like, we don't really know what the actual issue was. But it says... Um, yeah, that they're going to do a watch party by Bravo, the first in a series of upcoming events that will kick off this spring in New York and LA where fans can experience advanced screenings and exclusive sneak peeks of the network's buzziest buzz and most anticipated shows. Stay tuned for additional details in the coming weeks. I personally would not want to go to a watch party by Bravo. Would you? Like, do you need to go to a watch part? I guess, I mean, maybe that would be fun, but no, I like watching in my bed. I like watching my bed so I can, you know, talk all the shit I want, TikTok all the stuff I want, eat all the Nutella I want. We'll see. Ask Fly Girl says that Bravo is contending with legal matters. Andy Cohen, Carolyn Manzo, Brandy, maybe this is offset BravoCon. It's not a bad, um, a bad like thought to think that that's possibly what it is. I mean, it has been a highly contentious legal year for Bravo in the last few months, and maybe they just feel like it's too much. Maybe if they know more stuff is coming. Maybe they just want to see how this kind of plays out and um, 
and we'll see. So that's not a bad theory. Thank you so much. Um, Mark wants to sue Bravo for not having BravoCon, and that's okay because Bethany Frankel's on speed dial for this. So is Leah McSweeney, um, Brandy Glanville, Caroline Manzo, and who's the last to sue? Faith Stowers? Okay, we've got a whole list. We're we're really growing the crew. The legal team of it's like forget, you know, call baby James, gorgeous baby James or whatever his name was from OC or like here in LA everywhere you go you see Larry Parker or call Jacob. I'm calling them. I'm calling the Frankel, McSweeney, Glanville Stowers crew. So F M BS, FMBS. I mean, of course it would be FMBS. Let's add some more people to that list. Um, oh my God. Okay. So let's keep going, you guys. Lots of fun um, things to talk about with the Valley and VPR. Oh my God. My notes. You guys think I don't take notes. Well, looky here. And then I realized when I was taking notes on VPR, this is VPR side right here. So much, like so many scenes. <laughs> I feel like so much happened. It was crazy. So let's get into it. Um, Vanderpump Rules, I personally, I'm just going to, I'm calling it right now. And this could change, of course, throughout the season because according to Andy Cohen, it just gets better and better. But for me, Vanderpump Rules is the inferior show of the Tuesday night lineup on Bravo. I personally enjoy the Valley more. I don't know why specifically yet. I just know that I'm more interested during that hour than I am during Vanderpump Rules. Vanderpump Rules is giving me the ick. It just gives me the ick. I don't know what it is. Well, I can, I can tell you what it is. It's a bunch of people that like for the most part are unlikable to watch and it feels very forced. And last night's episode was just like a lot of them. I did think that there were some great moments and great scenes. Um, the show opens up, of course, at Beach Day still from this horrible Beach Day. Have they not learned anything? Beach Day does not work on Vanderpump Rules, okay? They are not West Siders. These people need to stay on like West Hollywood. And if you know LA, you know West Hollywood is not the West side. So they need to stay like West Hollywood, Hollywood, and then like go to Silver Lake. They're just, Vanderpump Rules does not connect with the West side. It's It feels like a very, um, I know Sheena lives there, but like, let's not go there anymore. It never really works for my brain. Now, when we are over in Vanderpump Rules at this beach day, of course, we open up to Ariana still being very angry and upset saying, what do you guys expect? What do you guys expect that I'm sitting here and you're putting Tom in front of my face and he's giving me these digs? Like, how could I not be annoyed? Total valid. Now, let's give Bumbling Idiot Award of the, not the day, not the season, maybe the entire show to Tom Schwartz. I don't mean this in like a weird way, but there's, there is a screw loose. Like Tom is, he's a handsome guy and he's sweet. But let me tell you, I would die if I was friends with this man the way that he just kind of like bumbles through life. Fumbles, bumbles, and humbles and chumbles through life. Like he's literally like a bumbling idiot. And the way he talks to, you know, uh, hey guys, so I don't really want to step on any more toes. So I think what I'm going to do is like, you know, I just want things to be like good. And so I think Tom and Tom and, Tom and I are going to go over to the bar. So I think it's going to be like, and Ariana's like, get the fuck out of here. Like GTFO. O-H. Get the fuck out of here. G-T-F-O-O-H. Bye. That's what I want to call this episode. Bye. So Ariana, um, and, and I was 100% like, you're right. Bye, Tom Schwartz. You're so annoying. And even Katie was like, bye. Now, Tom and Tom go to the bar, waterfront. I want to find out where this is. It's probably in Venice somewhere. They go to the bar and he's like, hey, do you have any like frozen, non-cut, non-alcoholic, like get drinks, you know, something to freshen me up? They end up having their drinks. Of course, Tom Schwartz is putting shots in his uh, non-alcoholic drink, which is just so typical of Tom Schwartz. And they sit there and then they have the most awkward exchange with these four girls that are sitting there. Now, I believe these four girls happen to just be at the beach at that moment. But like if you were watching back Vanderpump Rules and you were one of those four girls, Maddie and her friends or whatever their names were, wouldn't you be so mortified that you were in that scene? He's like, hey, guys, like what kind of round of shots would you want? Sandoval spends all of his money. The reason why Sandoval has no money is because he spends all of his money buying people drinks. I just feel like that's his go-to. 
He goes into every single room to say that, you know, I am trying to look like the nice guy. Like Sandoval's like sociopathic behavior, right? And then like Schwartz is trying to meet them. But like Schwartz is like, oh, I don't know how to meet girls. I'm just like so awkward. So awkward. Now, meanwhile, we have a great scene between Sheena, although Sheena and that bucket hat. I mean, I wish I had a bucket hat right now because I would love to use a prop for Sheena. But Sheena, Lala, and Ariana. Now, of course, in real life, IRL, where we are in April 2025, four? What year is this? Is it BravoCon year? 2024. We know that there is definitely some issues there, okay? We know that there's been some, call it jealousy, call it a friendship breaker. I think that Sheena and Lala are very close and Ariana and Katie aren't. Although... There was a lot of rumors in yesterday's baby shower uh, reveal, gender reveal. By the way, guys, I was right. Lala was having either a girl or a boy. She's having another girl. So Lala released her uh, baby shower, sorry, her gender reveal party. And in the background was Stassi, which is interesting because we know Stassi and Katie Maloney are tight, right? But apparently we didn't see Katie at the baby shower, but someone had said, or at the gender reveal, but someone had said Katie was there. So who really knows how close all of these people are or when was this gender reveal party? Was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago? You know, things are changing real fast in Lala, like, Lala land. So, you know, I don't know. In the last couple of weeks, Lala has gone to town talking badly about them. But Sheena happens to say that on Watch What Happens Live that we're going to all see at the reunion why this is the case. Listen, all they're doing is getting us to watch this show. No matter what they're doing, it's like, watch what happens. Watch what, you have to see. You'll have to see what happens. So in this scene, I actually felt for the first time, honestly, for the first time, because this is what vulnerability does for an audience. When Ariana showed that she was emotional, when Ariana showed that she was struggling, when she said that she was sad, when she was heartbroken, et cetera, whether it's a little bit about the house or Sandoval, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that he, that we're seeing emotion that's not just like tough exterior that immediately makes you say, okay, this is her coping mechanism. Not everyone's the same, right? Some people hysterically cry and fall apart and some people just like get tough and move on. La- Ariana is one of those. And I thought it was a beautiful a uh, moment for Ariana to kind of give us a little bit of just like, I don't know, like just like lowering your wall. And it made me feel a lot more sympathy for her. And I think it's going to change um, a lot of people's audience. A lot of the people that were on the fence of like, oh, she's not really sad. Like you could tell she's sad. So whatever, even if it's about the house and not just about Tom, I think it's a whole general feeling of like thinking that you're having a certain kind of life and it all gets pulled away from you. Now we talk a lot about the house because Tom brought up like a dumbass. Sandoval brings up the freaking batteries again. I mean, like you don't understand, like Ariana is not going to know what to do when she moves because like I get the toilet paper and the paper towels and the batteries and the pens. Uh, Is he trying to score an Amazon Prime sponsorship? That's the only thing I can think is that Tom Sandoval is really gunning for Amazon Prime to give him a brand deal. Who the fuck can't buy batteries? Ariana's going to struggle. Ariana's on Broadway in Chicago and she's going to struggle getting batteries in our house. Yeah. Keep dreaming, Sandy. Um, so let's think what else. Okay. Uh, so much happened in the episode, but I don't really like feel like that much is super. Um, I don't need to go into like all the details, although I could really spend 37 minutes talking about Sandoval and what a douchebag he is. But, um, But they end up, you know, chilling, having fun. James and Ali Bali come over and then Tori Keith. Let's talk about Tori Keith for a moment, which I'm going to get into on my Patreon this week because I've known Tori since she was 12 years old, maybe younger, I think around 12. Remember, she used to come in for me all the time to audition. I've cast her on a bunch of things. And then I was her agent. I was Tori's agent in 2016, 17. Okay. So I know Tori. So this is shocking to me to watch. That's all I'm going to say about that. It is shocking to me to watch. And let me tell you, in all the years of Vanderpump Rules, 
In all the years, we're talking water tasting. We're talking Graham's baby shower or gender reveal or whatever the hell that puppy party was years ago with Rachel. We're talking all of these things. I have never in my life felt like a storyline was so produced as this weird, creepy trio situation between um, Katie and Tom and Tori. It was making me feel icky. And is that just because I know Tori? Like I need to know from you guys if you all felt the same. It was giving me creepy vibes. Maybe it's because she's so much younger than them. Tom is just feeling so like busted. And the fact that Tori comes over there and she's like so into Tom Schwartz, like she's so into him and she wants so badly to like hook up with him, which is just weird to me. Cause like, why you've known him for all these years and you want to hook up with him? Like it's strange. Um, but she's all about him and should the way she's talking to him, it was giving actor and it was giving bad actor. It was giving like Notes that I used to give her when she used to audition for Disney shows. It was giving more energy, bigger. Use bigger facial expressions. I didn't love it. And I don't think Tori's that kind of person in real life. Like, I mean, she's personable. Like, don't get me wrong, but it just felt so put on. You know what? I like champagne. Okay, so he goes and gets her a bottle. By the way, can you imagine being with a guy and saying like, you know what I like to drink champagne. And he goes and buys you a bottle of champagne. <laughs> like He's like, I'm getting you wasted tonight because then I don't want to feel so bad that I'm the only one getting wasted or I'm trying to hook up with you. He buys her a bottle of champagne. Then we get this moment where Katie Maloney out of nowhere decides to leave her crew. She would never do this in normal world, like go and leave her crew to hang out with Tom and Tom right? But she leaves her crew to go over to Tori and they start getting kind of like huggy, touchy, feely. It's so uncomfortable to watch. And I'm not saying this because it's two women. Trust me. I'm not saying this because it's two women. But when you then see that like Katie kind of, I felt like Tori was really into Schwartz. Like I felt like she was there to hook up with Schwartz. And then Katie just kind of like grabbed her, like just pulled her away and was like, sorry, you're mine now. It was giving creepy older couple at a resort vibes. That's just my thought. Katie then goes and sits with her separately. And when I tell you, I have never in all my years of Vanderpump Rules seen Katie like this ever. It was such a, yes, Andrew says it, like I wanted to say it, swinger vibes. It's giving the older couple at the resort that wants to be a swinger. I've been, I've been in the receiving end of that. It's it's creepy. Like you're talking to the guy and then all of a sudden the girl comes over to you and then the guy comes over to you and it's like, what is happening? So they're having this like weird back and forth, right? And then Katie, she's like Katie, who's like a tough bitch, right? She has her personality. She doesn't give, she doesn't like, she's not fake, right? All of a sudden she's like, hi, hi, Tori, you can kiss me. Have you ever been with a woman? (laughs) I was like, I cannot watch Katie this way. Like, I prefer Katie being a bitch. I do not want to see Katie flirty. It made me feel so uncomfortable. I've never dated a woman, but I've had sex with a woman. You can kiss me. I could not handle it. Michelle says, stop with the gay baiting Bravo. And a lot of people are feeling this way between Kyle Richards and now this. I mean, do I believe that you can be hooking up with another woman? Fine. Like I, I'm not a get, I, I look, is it gay baiting? If you just want to hook up with another girl, at least in this moment, we're actually seeing them hook up and not just being like, we're just friends. We're just friends. But lick me. Right. It was weird. I've never seen Katie so happy as she was in this episode because now she's had two episodes back to back where she's gotten laid and now she's hooking up with someone else. Like the reason why Katie's been a sour puss bitch for the entire like run of this show is because she was with Schwartz who probably literally was like, <laughs> can I, can I, um, tickle your back? Oh, never mind. I'm so nervous. I'm going to run to the other room. Oh, no. Can I get you a drink? Oh God. No, no. Oh, let's go and like hang out with Tom Sandoval. 
Anyway, it was real weird. So seeing them make out was weird. Seeing their hands all over each other was weird. Knowing that she was just into Schwartz and she's going on a date with Schwartz was weird. Okay, whatever. I've got to get through this because I'm spending too much time. Um, then we see a scene between Lala and Joe. And Lala gets a lot of heat for this later, but they go to Taylor the Pup. Funny story about Taylor the Pup. I don't really know where it is now. I'm assuming it's somewhere in Hollywood. That actual hot dog stand used to be by the Beverly Center, which is if you're in LA, you know the area, by Cedar sinai Hospital. It was on La Cienega. No, it was on San Vicente and Beverly Boulevard-ish. And I used to go there after my ballet classes as a little kid all the time to get a hot dog. They like literally picked up that hot dog and moved it somewhere else. So they go to a Taylor the Pup and they have this conversation. Look, you cannot have a normal conversation with Joe, okay? You just can't. And when I say normal, I mean just not an awkward, strange, weird interaction. But this is the thing about Lala. And you can call her a bad friend or whatever. And you can call her a flip-flopper. And you can call her all these things. But like, I like Lala. I'm sorry, you guys. It's okay to like someone that's not super popular. I like Lala because Lala actually doesn't do the popular thing. She doesn't um, she doesn't like uh, pander to the audience. She doesn't pander to anyone really. And that can be misconstrued as being a bad friend. But I like that she went out with Joe. Joe reached out to her and she said, yes. Wouldn't she be so much more of a bitch if she was like, no, I'm not giving you my time. She's like, I grabbed a hot dog with her. It's not like we are, you know, hooking up or she's going to be my best friend. Joe and her have this conversation where Joe's like, I just kind of want to be more included and just like more um, involved because at this point she still thinks, and this is actually like you guys, poor Joe in last night's episode. If you didn't feel at all bad for Joe in last night's episode, like question your heart because- No matter what, she's gotten taken advantage of in this situation completely. Joe is in her mind in a relationship with Schwartz at this point. And so she's like, I am trying to get in with the crew and maybe Lala will give me that in. And you know what? I didn't mind the conversation. It was short. It didn't really have like anything to say. But Lala basically said like, did you not know about Sandoval and Raquel? And Joe, and I swear I kind of believe her. It was like, I didn't. I thought that they were broken up. Like, I had no idea. I was into shorts. I was only paying attention to shorts, which I think that that's who Joe is. I think, like, she can be out in a crowd of a million and just only have eyes for, um, you know, dad bod Ken. Anyway, um, I felt really bad for her. Okay, you guys, a lot of you guys agree with me. Thank God. But you guys, a lot of you had feelings about um, Lala. Lala is a hypocrite. She's making a fool out of herself. It's major jealousy. Um, Yeah, she may be jealous. I think Lala is going to be just fine though. I think Lala is in a better like career position completely, way better than Katie. I think Lala has got like a very big brand. Um, I like Lala. I'm sorry. Um, Sheena, on the other hand, whoo. They go to Top Golf, James and Ali Bali, and um, and Katie and Ariana. Um, weirdest group, weirdest place to go. Strange, strange choice, but whatever. This again is a Vanderpump rules. Like we we got the okay to shoot at Top Golf. Let's go. Um, what can I say about this? Nothing really, except for the fact that James had a really good few confessional moments in this episode where he basically spoke for what we were thinking. He spoke about Tom Schwartz's hair, which we'll talk about in a second. And he spoke about um, the relationship, weird love triangle between Tori, Katie, and Tom. He said exactly what we're all thinking, which is what the is going on? Like why in the world are these two older like exes fighting over this young teenager? (laughs) She's 24 or something, but it's so weird. It is so weird. Um, so that's the one thing about James, although, you know, I still think James is putting on an act for us. I'm just going to be honest. 
Um, they talked about like Ariana moving, how she wants to move to a tree house, which she ended up getting a house in the Hollywood Hills. So I think that's kind of similar. Uh, Katie was saying how she doesn't care about Schwartz. She doesn't do anything for Schwartz. Schwartz is not the important thing to her. I disagree 1000%. I think Schwartz is still very important to her in her mind in some way, which is why she hooked up with Max, which is why she's hooking up with Tori. And if you guys think that, no, it's just random that she happened to hook up with two people that, you know, would affect Schwartz in some way. I would, I think Katie's a little smarter than that. I don't think it's random. There's way too many people in Los Angeles to hook up with. You don't go after two that would affect your exes. Um, and she talks a little bit about this in the after show. She's like, no, it has nothing to do with that. But for me, I do believe, in my opinion, I do believe that it was um, intentional, which was fun for her to do. And you know what? I get it. Freaking Schwartz, man. Um, we go to the sperm bank, cryobank, cryobank with Brian. Brian, who uh, was like such a Vanderpump Rules fan. He's like, hi, Lala. Hi, Sheena. <laughs> hey, guys, you want my sperm? Um, Lala's story of having a child on her own because she doesn't want the child to be shared with someone that she can't trust down the line, she doesn't know where things are going to go, is a blessing to anyone out there that wants to have a child without a man involved. I really, truly believe that she is paving the way for a lot of people that are scared to say this out loud. Um, a lot of people I know have had babies with sperm donors. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I love her story about this. Sorry. Like I said, I like Lala, so it's really hard for me to see that as a negative thing. I really do like the fact that she's doing this. I know she, it's an unpopular opinion because there's a lot of people out there that think she's being like, you know, she's denying the opportunity for a child to have a father, but please, my dad was a shit dad, is a shit dad, so I would be okay if my dad wasn't around to be 100% honest, but um this was the moment where Lala and Sheena seemed to be like shit talkers because they had just had that conversation with Ariana where they're like, we got you and like, we got to get you out of that house and we got to, you know, I know how sad you feel and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And now all of a sudden the cryobank, they're talking about like, well, she's just taken, um, you know, she's just trying to take over opportunity of this, uh, of, you know, this situation. She's taking advantage of it and get out of that house. And, you know, it felt like a little bit of shit talking behind her back. And Sheena kept saying like, I know, I know. I'm just like hoping this goes away. I'm hoping this goes away. It, it makes me wonder if either, I mean, I think that it, it, two things could be true, but I do think there may be privy to a lot of conversations about this that we're not part of where they're like, I want to rip my hair out if I have to talk about the fact that she still lives with Tom Sandoval. Like, get out of there, you know? Um, either way, it was giving a little mean girl, especially from Sheena. Like, you kind of expect it from Lala, but Sheena, no. Uh, okay, Joe then decides to ruin Schwartz's life by dyeing his hair blonde. And let me tell you, I don't know where that hair salon was. I do think they have the same um, Target wallpaper background as I do. I don't know where it was, but I will tell you one thing. I will tell you one thing. This hair salon is between Joe and her chomping of her gum with an open mouth, which is such, I have misophonia. So like, this is something that I struggle with. If I ever see someone chewing gum with a mouth open, I want to run and I want to jump and I want to, um, you know, take like, a. I don't know. I don't know. I need to cut off my ears if I ever see that. But also then you see the other girl <laughs> that was helping with her hair, did you guys notice her? Like, this is going to sound, I'm not going to say it. Just go back and watch. It just felt like an interesting hair salon experience. They decide to do 14 processes to Schwartz's hair and they give him hair that looks like, damn it, I wish I had a prop. I mean, this, this may be a bad choice, but this is the closest I can see. Hold on. <laughs> Tom Schwartz has the most horrendous hair I've ever seen in my entire life during this scene. It was so crazy. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? But the most important part about this is that Joe is doing Tom Schwartz's hair and she's thinking she's doing her boyfriend's hair. Like there's there's clearly a level, level of Delulu going on in this scene. And in this whole moment, there's a level of Delulu. It's not working. It's, it's very strange. And Tom is not getting the hint. 
So he says, I'm going to a singles event. He says he went on a date with Tori. He's saying all these things. And meanwhile, Joe's like, can I come? I want to hang out with you at a singles event. Wait, why didn't Tom Schwartz immediately just try to say like, no, I'm just going with the dudes. Like, that's what he should have said. He didn't have to hurt her feelings and say, you can't come. She did invite herself, but he should have said, you need to like, you know, you need to not join me. Like you're going to be a cock blocker to me or like, it's just a guy's thing. This is really just for Sandoval. And sure enough, they end up going to this singles event, which is quite possibly the most awkward thing I've ever seen with really just like low key, the strangest people I've ever seen at these events. Like one of them wanted to lick Tom Schwartz's like face off. It was so gross. I was really not into any of these people at the singles event, which made me think that if I'm ever single, I'm not going to a singles event. Like it just won't happen again for me ever, no matter what. I will never do that. But also, um, but also if you are a Kia's world watcher, that will like hit you in some way, Rachel Hollis. But also at this singles event, Joe is futzing with Tom's hair for so long, consist like almost like like she had a OCD need to do it or like a compulsion. That's the word I'm thinking, a compulsion. to like constantly futz with her hair, futz with his hair, which was real strange. It's giving like, I didn't bring hair and makeup to this event for a reason. Um, started, you know, obviously acting really touchy-feely with him. And then when he went off and did his own thing, she kept kind of getting weirded out. She was there for him. And this was the moment where she had to again run off. Look, I felt bad for Joe. This is not a good showing for this person. Then, you know, on top of that, with the the way she did his hair, which was just horrendous, it's just giving like, it's not helping her career. It's not helping her social circles. Like it's definitely not going to help her in the dating world. It was, it was too much for me. Then we have like, of course, on the other side, Tom Sandoval, which bless our hearts, we didn't get too much Tom in this episode. Like we got a break from Tom Sandoval. Did you guys notice that? But we got this new um, assistant of his, Craig. No intro to him, just a just a name title. Craig, the tattooed guy. Who is he? Who is this Craig? Right? Who is he? Why aren't we getting a, a discussion about Craig? But Craig, Kyle Chan, which kills me, imagining Kyle Chan at the singles event. And Tom Sandoval are there, but they're just kind of like throwaway people. It's all about Joe and Tom Schwartz. We then have a girls' night, which was giving the craziest Quentin Tarantino, uh, you know, Sex in the City vibes. You get these four girls walking. And again, if you know the Valley, and if you're here in LA, on Riverside Drive in Sherman Oak Studio City is Foxfire. And when I tell you, I've been to Foxfire two times, and both times have been the most divey bar. It's such a dive bar. It's not even like I mean, like, I don't think it's like cool dive. One time I went and they had like a buffet of like chicken wings. It was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. But they walked the four girls in these hot outfits, giving sex appeal, like, and the camera angle and it's slow motion and the music and the legs going up and it's like, and then they walk into the diviest bar you've ever seen in your entire life. Like, why? are they wearing those outfits? It's almost like they were supposed to go to Hollywood. And then like last minute, they were like, oh shit, we can't shoot at the Hollywood place. Like we got we to gotta pivot to a dive bar in the Valley. It was real odd. It was real odd. And they go to um, this dive bar. They end up having a conversation where Lala brings up the fact that she had dinner with Joe or she had a hot dog with Joe. And Katie is not happy about it. Katie gets really upset about it. I don't get it. Is Katie like that angry with Joe and why? Why? Because she's hooking up with Schwartz or she did hook up with Schwartz. I don't think Katie and Joe were ever that close. So she's a little bit weird. I don't know. It was a little strange. Lala was like, don't come after me. I'm soft. And Katie's like, but you're not soft with us, which is true, which is true. Um, I don't think it was the hill that Katie should have dived, died on. But I think this was probably the straw that broke the camel's back in the sense like you're constantly hanging out with um, like Sandoval now and stuff. Like what's going on with you? Who are you trying to be? You're trying to be Schwartz's and Sandoval's best friend and now Joe's friend? Like what's up? 
where, you know, where do you lie? Laura says she's still angry at Schwartz, 1 million percent. Katie has unresolved feelings for Schwartz. There's no question. Whether it's bitterness, angry, sadness, love, who knows what. There's, it's not like, it's not processed, I think. And she pretends like it is, but it keeps coming up. Um, and then we have a paintballing scene, which you guys, I can't, I don't even have the time or energy to get into. It was like, my version of hell is to go paintballing with this crew, this ragtag crew. I don't get it. I'm confused why Sheena and Lala and, and Allie even went to talk. Like, the girls should have stayed home and just like gone to a coffee. It was very strange, but they talked about the fact that Katie was mad with Lala about it. And then we end up with actually one of the saddest scenes. And this is Tom Schwartz failing horrifically at trying to be nice while breaking up with someone. He essentially had to finally tell Joe, it's not working. I think that we need to, you know, just like kind of set more boundaries or not hang out as much. And Joe's like, or at all. And Joe wanted Tom to be like, well, no, we can't not hang out at all. I love you. But Joe's like, no, you don't understand. Like we have something amazing. I just can see us getting old and like just being together forever and just like laughing so much. And Tom's like, me too. I can't, but I don't want to be with you. And Joe's like, but like, I just don't think that, you know, you'll ever find anything like this. And Tom's like, we, we won't. We will never find anything this amazing. And like, I love you and I am so passionate about you and our chemistry is out of control and I'm obsessed with you and you're the best ever, but we cannot be together. It's so confusing. And Joe starts to cry and he's like, Joseph, Joseph. And she's like, no, it's okay. I need to call my dad. You guys, I've really felt for Joseph. Joseph and her amazing Technicolor dream coat was it was a killer for me. I did. Now, Jewelry Girl says Joseph is delusional. True. True. Okay. Definitely Delulu. But also, but also, just, I don't know. I felt bad. I think Tom Schwartz has the capability of probably breaking every girl's heart that he's with because he's the kind of guy that will hold on to someone forever just to not hurt their feelings. So he's going to wait for them to like break their own heart. He needs to be broken up with, essentially. He can't break up with someone on his own. Um, Kimmy says, I've been in a similar situation with the breadcrumbing. I think a lot of people have. You know, you take anything you can get. Because when they need you, when they want you, it's like all of a sudden they, you're just like so happy and you're so like, you just feel so thrilled that they're giving you that. You guys, I'm noticing, I don't usually see this when I do my other um, live streaming, but here on YouTube, of course, we have 372 people live. Welcome to the show. But only 58 likes? Like, what's going on? And by the way, are all 372 of you guys subscribed right now? If not, subscribe. Get on that subscribe train. Come on, you guys. Help me out. Help assist out. Okay, we went up to 59 likes. Um, all right, let's get into the valley. Um, I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Okay, let's get into the valley. Um, thanks, Kimmy. All right. This next story is brought to you by Row Body. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the Row Body program, which essentially is a way to lose weight using the most popular weight loss shots on the market. It pairs a weekly shot with healthy lifestyle changes so you can lose 15 to 20% of your weight in a year on average and actually keep it off. Over 200,000 people have already chosen Row to help them lose weight, and uh, the members have support throughout the process. You can sign up online from the comfort of your own home. This means no scheduling a doctor's appointment, no commute to the doctor's office, and no waiting rooms. Average weight loss is 15 to 20% off in 20, 15 to 20% in one year. Um, with healthy lifestyle changes, BMI and other eligibility criteria apply, go to row.co slash Donna. That's row.co slash Donna. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 for your first month and $145 a month after that. Medication costs are separate. That's row.co slash Donna. Okay. The Valley. I have to say, 
Well, I already said it already. I love the Valley. But we start the show at the, you know, both VPR and the Valley left us in between scenes, you know, between last week's and this week. You know, on VPR, we were at the, the beach and in the Valley, we're at the Capri dinner that Jesse and Michelle are having in their fancy, fancy home. Um, <laughs> And this is like in the middle of, you know, a traumatic situation where Kristen Doty is bringing us back. Like I had deja vu watching this scene because I was like, we are watching Vanderpump Rules because of course Kristen Doty is getting herself in the middle of all the shit. And honestly, Kristen Doty, who's following me on Instagram now, by the way, she followed me over the weekend, Kristen Doty, and so did Sutton Strack, really racking up those housewives and Bravo liberties. Kristen Doty, bless her heart for being so able to be herself on camera for all her good, bad, and ugly, because trust me, we've seen it all. I just want to shake her. I want to shake Kristen Doty and be like, don't be such an idiot. Sorry. I think that Kristen Doty bringing this up, bringing the storyline up, especially given her past with the racism, with Faith Stowers, with getting fired, with getting canceled. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And meanwhile, we have this whole storyline where she's trying to have a baby and she's trying to like grow up and yet she is not any different. She drinks too heavily and she says too much. And she's, she's honest. She's like, I, I don't lie. I say too much, but I don't lie. So at least she's being very clear about who she is, but I truly do not understand why she is just getting herself in this muck constantly. Michelle um, Jesse's wife stands up, right? She stands up. She starts yelling at Kristen. I was pretty surprised by this too, which we'll talk about in just a moment. She yells at Kristen. They're going after Kristen. Now Kristen's trying to throw Lego, Lego man under the bus, which by the way, Lego man, watch the, watch the show on YouTube. If you want to see the, the, um, you know, the props Lego Luke is insufferable. I, I can't. I cannot watch a whole season with Lego Luke. I can't. Everything he does drives me insane. The way he speaks, the way he looks, his faces, his uh, uh, uh. I cannot handle Lego Luke. But Lego Luke decides to, you know, again, try to stand up for himself and not help Kristen Doty at all. This is not a good friend. Okay. Lego Luke brought Kristen Doty this information. Kristen Doty was idiotic enough to talk about the fact that this was said, but Lego Luke is actually the problem. Lego Luke, it's you. You're the problem. It's you. Can't handle it. Oh, his name's Zach. <laughs> this whole time I've given him a new name. Lego Zach. But it's, I really wish it was Luke. Can we give him Lego Luke as a name? That's confusing because Luke is um, Kristen's boyfriend. Fine, Lego Zach, LZ. Now, um, Michelle says, do you think when he goes to the salon, instead of bringing in Spo picks, he brings his Legos? Well, I'll tell you one thing. He goes to Joe to get his hair done. There's no question. Like, I don't doubt it. A hundred percent, he's at Joe's, uh, he goes to Joe's hair salon. So at this moment, um, you know, Kristen Doty gets yelled at. She gets attacked. She's like, I'm leaving. Luke is like, I'm leaving with her. We're leaving. We're leaving. We're yelling. We're going. And then they don't go anywhere. They just end up staying there. I don't know why. I don't know how they got, you know, forced to stay. But then of course, Jackson, a confessional has to say like, I don't understand this girl. Like she doesn't change. I mean, I, I, Jax is Kristen Doty's best friend, quote unquote, that also wants her to, you know, like die a fiery death. It's the craziest relationship I've ever seen. Now they go, you know, Kristen Doty is getting hugged on by Luke in the corner and she decides to stay while everyone's still yelling at her. She decides to have a conversation, a solid conversation with, with Lego Zach, uh, created by Brittany who has introduced the two of them. Okay, y'all, you guys sit and talk. Okay. You make it okay. All right. You do it. And Kristen's like, mm, I am so, so disappointed in you, Lego. And Lego Zach is like, me? Why? And why me? I didn't, I mean, Kristen. 
I mean, it's just like annoying people in one room together. I can't. They all decide to come and join the group and everyone's fighting. And Janet, bless her heart with her pregnant belly. I mean, she remains calm, cool, and collected and she is cutting. She's cool, calm, collected, and cutting with her words towards Kristen. She does not like her. It's very obvious. Now later, um, we have a scene at Brittany and Jax's house, which broke my freaking heart. Okay. And seriously, you can talk all the shit you want about Jax. And you know, I like Brittany now from listening to her interview yesterday, but hearing them talk so openly about what they're going through with their two, almost three-year-old son, Cruz, and his speech delays and occupational therapy and seeing how he's struggling. To see them talk about it and to see the fact that they're trying everything they can and they're bringing in, um, you know, a, uh, some sort of a, uh, what's it called? Like a, uh, I guess speech therapist. She's a speech therapist. That's the word. And um, they're bringing her in and they're doing everything they possibly can and they can't figure it out. And they're talking about how the fact that Jax is really, really trying to give a, you know, a sort of a, give him his own path and not compare him to other kids. If you've ever had a kid that is challenged in any way, whether it's speech delayed, whether it's like physically delayed, whether it's, you know, hitting those milestones, um, or just a little bit different than other kids, I think you're going to recognize this feeling really fast and relate to it. It's so, so hard. I think when you're going through like kids that are growing up at the exact same time and you're seeing what other kids are going through and you're comparing. And I have a friend who has a son who is on the spectrum. And I remember when our kids were very young together and my son was like, like really verbally advanced for his age and it was hard. And she was honest with me. It was hard to be together. So I really felt for them during that moment. So I hope everything is going to be okay with Cruzy cute little cruise. Now, Jesse and Michelle have a conversation. Notice you'll never, never, guys, I, I promise you right now, notice you will never see Jesse on this show without a drink in his hand. I don't know what's going on. It doesn't matter if it's daytime, nighttime, at a hockey field. He's always drinking. So he has a, he has a beer and, um, and, you know, he gives Michelle a water and they're talking about the night before. She immediately is, like, immediately is like, I need to go to bed tonight. The second, like, she's like, I don't want to talk to you the second our daughter goes to bed. Um, but they start kind of like bonding over this conversation about Kristen and Luke and what went down the night before. And they're laughing. And what's crazy is they're just having just a normal conversation that you would have maybe with your husband, like just something that makes you laugh. And she said, we haven't laughed like this in forever. And I thought to myself, like, this was not hysterical peeing our pants, laughing, like the giggles for 17 minutes. This is just like one conversation where they're laughing a little. Their relationship is over. The second you stop laughing with your partner, like never, ever laughing, that's not a good sign, right? Because laughing is so important in a relationship. Um, and anyway, they end up bonding over their their feelings about Kristen. Now we see Kristen and Luke over in their apartment. And I'll tell you something. I have to be 100% frank, honest, and all those things. Kristen is a hot mess in these scenes. Like, I couldn't believe that she allowed cameras in there. Did anyone else feel this way? I'm like, girl, you have not been on TV for years. You finally get back on a show and you allow your cameras coming into the room with your hair looking like that, with no bra, big ass, uh, you know, boobies, like in a t-shirt, with your carpal tunnel uh, wrist guard, with like dogs everywhere. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, and Janet's the pregnant one, right? Janet's the pregnant one. And she looks cute with her little crop top cooking dinner, like all put together. And meanwhile, Kristen is sitting there like, just like looking a hot mess as she hung over. I was so confused by this moment. It's like, get it together a little bit. Now we're seeing a lot of conversations with her and her hopefully soon to be baby daddy, Luke. And it feels like, um, you know, 
it feels like they're having these like serious conversations about having kids and where should we move and where should we go and where should, what should we do? And I'm like, get Luke out of LA immediately. And also while you're at it, like leave LA, Kristen. She keeps saying like, I just need to be in California. It's for my work. I'm confused. Does anyone know what that is? Like, I understand you want to be in California, but let's be honest. Like, do you need to be in California when you have a podcast? I mean, I guess if she's thinking about the Valley as a job, but it was a really strange, um, it's just a strange, they have a strange relationship. I believe that they love each other and I believe that they're happy together from what we've seen in the show, but I just don't like, there's some chemistry missing. Something's missing between the two of them, but I have no idea. I have no idea. You know, I've met them together and they seem nice. He's really nice. He is super nice. And she was super nice when I met them. So maybe they do have a genuine relationship. This was also shot like months ago when they were newer. So I don't know. Or Actually, I think they've been together a while now. Um, they decide that, you know, she and Lego man are back together as friends because they realize they were just pawns in Janet's game. We see Janet talking to her husband about how she can't stand Kristen. We're setting it up for this gala that is about to come up. Um, then we see the boys trip to the OC fair. Now, if you go, I've never been to the OC fair personally, but it's not close. Like it's a solid hour drive, if not more with traffic. You see these three guys, by the way, Daniel Bucco, he's the, he is Nia's husband. He's the one that helps set, sets up the romantic dinner. I, I think he's the number one guy in every group. Does anyone agree with me here? I love him. And remember, I've auditioned him before, so I've met him. He is a wonderful human being from what we're seeing. He is a good dad. He seems like a good husband. He seems like a good friend. I'm really liking Daniel. Nia and Daniel are the stars on the show for me. Um, okay. So I think they're a little boring maybe for a reality show, but I love them. They go to the OC fair. We're having this moment where the three dads are talking to the three kids, of course, drinking. I'm not saying anything about that because you're at the OC fair. I mean, how else do you get through it? But like notice with Jesse. Um, and they're having conversations about everything that went down and with Kristen. And then Jax, of course, decides to say like her therapy is not working because Jax is such a jerk when it comes to Kristen. Um, but meanwhile, they they do daddy things, which was sweet, I guess. I don't know. Then we see Brittany and Dan Danny setting up for um, their – for Kristen and Luke's romantic night while Kristen and Luke are on this date, essentially continuing the conversation. By the way, I want to go to this restaurant. It looks like it's right by Sir. Soulmate, it looked so cute. But they're having a conversation, continuing the conversation they had back at the apartment about, you know, having a baby, about having a lot of sex, about her saying that this is the benefit of having a 32-year-old boyfriend with a very large penis. I didn't need to know that. Anyone else? Didn't need to know that. Now, Luke is like, I'm not moving to California ever. Like, I'm definitely not moving to Los Angeles. Kristen's like, I want to stay in Los Angeles, but at least California. Don't you see this as like a little bit of a sticking point? Like, why would you consider to have kids with someone that you haven't decided on this together? I just worry. That just feels like something that's going to come up later. Whenever you get someone to move for you or not move for you, there's always resentment that builds in. That's what I think. So, um. Brittany and Daniel end up going and having the most scary fire hazard setup date I've ever seen in my life. What the hell? Number one, did you guys know Kristen had four dogs? One being huge, massive, and a big barker in a small apartment. And that apartment, by the way, is across the street from Fox Fire, like catty corner from Fox Fire. So if you know that apartment, Katie lives there and Kristen lives there. It's a big building. So now that I'm thinking about it, like they probably just like picked Katie up and like walked. Um. So they light candles everywhere. And then there was like four dogs walking around. I'm thinking, what the hell is going to happen here? Like if I, I couldn't believe that they left lit candles in a house with like all these dogs in a condo, in an apartment building. Hopefully it was like a three second, you know, maybe there was cameras in there. Um, but it was sweet, Brittany. And the whole time she's like, I don't know why Jax can't throw me any sort of romance. You know, I told him mom's only here until the end of August. And I, I would love to have some romantic night. Jax mentions the fact that they don't have sex. Brittany says that they haven't had sex, you guys, more than two times in a year. 
She says that on Not Skinny But Not Fat. Jax doesn't, in fact, say that, but he says he went from having sex four to five times a week, a day, sorry, wanting to have sex four to five times a day to being like, did we have sex this month? Y'all, that's not a good sign in a marriage. And what's crazy is it, it's not because Brittany doesn't want it. Like Brittany is very clearly saying like, I want romance. I want sex. Whenever you have the man who used to have a high sex drive decide he doesn't want to have sex with you, what does that mean? It's giving Carl and Lindsay. Something is happening here. So anyway, they have their romantic date night. Um, Brittany, poor thing, is, is talking how she wishes she had a romantic date night. The closest she gets is to go to the gala. Now, in the car to go to the gala, they're in a car with Jason. I'm sorry, with um, Janet and her husband. I think his name is Jason. Like, I can't remember his name for the life of me. Lovely man. And Jax and Brittany. And this is a weird conversation because Jax is like, we cannot spend a lot of money tonight at the gala. You know, at these galas, they always have like silent auctions and stuff or bids or whatever. We cannot spend a lot of money. And Brittany's like, I'm thinking 2,500. And Jax is like, no, you don't understand. Speech therapy is $150 an hour. We cannot spend a lot of money. Weird conversation to have in a car, like on camera for Jax. Um, we just, cause it's like an interesting conversation with everything that we know right now that Brittany is paying all the bills and the utilities. It's like interesting. It's interesting. They go to the Be The Match Foundation Gala. Everyone looks like beautiful except Jesse. Jesse comes looking like Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Jesse comes looking ridiculous, like absolutely ridiculous. And um, anyway, they go to the gala. They end up having this conversation a little bit into it with Kristen and Michelle, where Kristen tries to apologize to Michelle with Lego uh, Lego land right next to her and Jesse. And it gets really heated before it finally kind of calms down. And the truth is, I think from what I heard from Brittany, I think that Janet and Michelle really don't like Kristen probably the entire season or at least the entire summer. We'll have to see. I worry for Kristen, you guys, the fact that she didn't bring Luke to the party because she had to say this out loud that Jill had diarrhea all over the place. I can't. It's just giving smelly. It's giving Tori spelling. Just saying. Just saying. All right, you guys. I love the Valley. I'm finding it really, really interesting. And um, of course, I've got to jump. But you guys, thank you for rolling with the tech, tech punches today. Thank you so much for being here, subscribing, following, and leaving a five-star review. If you're over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it makes a huge, huge difference for me. And if you are over here, make sure to hit the like button. We've moved up in our likes already. Thank God. And subscribe. Press subscribe if you haven't. Please help my show. Thank you so much, you guys. Have an amazing rest of your day. Bye.